Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. Your gates will always be open. By day or night, they will never be shut. God be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us,
Jesus Christ. According to Luke, Glory to you, Jesus came down with the 12 apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Jesus, your words are a blessing even when they're hard. Speak that we may listen. Amen. Almost two decades ago, I was a junior in undergrad, and I had this English professor. Well, she was an English professor in training, having nearly completed her dissertation, uh, and I called her almost professor. And I called her almost professor because she hated my writing. And I was very offended, and so I would call her the almost professor, which is not mature, but I was 20. So, she, <laughs> so she's convinced I'm this terrible writer, and she took every paper as an opportunity to tell me how terrible my writing was. I think her main critique was that I wrote about the characters as if they were like real actual people, not figments of someone's imagination. A very fair critique. And I would argue if someone doesn't want me to get lost in the particular quirks and nuances of a husband and wife who have fallen out of love, then stop writing such compelling stories. And I remember one of these days after a particularly bad grade, I went to her after class and I, I explained to her that she didn't have to worry about how bad my writing was because everyone knows English majors are for people who still don't know what they want to do when they grow up. <laughs> Needless to say, that didn't go over well. She was very offended and she promptly suggested that I switch majors. The whole semester, I sweated every assignment, every paper, and then somewhere near the latter half of the semester, it clicked. I finally got how my very real professor was encouraging me to abandon what I had prematurely settled into as my writing style and helped me gain skills not only that I didn't know I had, they were skills I didn't even know I should want to have. How many of you can relate to this story? 
I bet every person in here has a story just like this. And if you don't have one, I hope one day you get one. Because I don't know why, but there is magic in the rub, the friction. The rub is the thing that makes you uncomfortable, that thing that refuses to let you just quietly go about your day blissfully content. The rub, the pebble in the shoe, that thing that just won't let you shake the feeling that maybe, just maybe, you're not perfect. Jesus was the king of the rub. Jesus has a lot of honorific titles in our tradition. Lamb of God, son of man. Maybe we should add rub royalty in the mix too. This is something that Jesus is phenomenal at, the ultimate rub. The one who could and did in a mere four foreboding sentences invite us to wonder and question all that we have been taught about what makes a good life. And just so you know ahead of time, we're stuck. There's no escape hatch. I know sometimes preachers do this. There's an escape at the end, and it's like, oh, whoa. This time, there's no such thing. And trust me, I tried. <laughs> I've used some of my nifty ex exegetical trips, tricks, hoping that I could get us out of these four woe pronouncements. In my snooping, or my research, I learned that the English woe is translated from the Greek way. It's not a verb, it's not a noun, but an interjection, an exclamation used to exclaim grief, and it's found all over scripture. So if I want to get rid of these four woes and make them mean something less dire, well then I'd have to change the meanings of all the woes in scripture, and I'm not allowed to do that. So we're stuck. Stuck right here with Jesus saying, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. So what do we do? Any ideas? I thought... We could all nervously bite our nails together, but then realize that that won't work since we're still in the pandemic and we have all these masks on. So what do we do with this passage? We can't explain it away. I've tried. We could bury it. Christians have been known to do that. Everyone here, who's here has heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Okay. How many of you have heard of the Sermon on the Plain? Just a couple. And that's right. That's what this one. This is the less popular twin because on the plain, Jesus doesn't spiritualize anything. There's no blessed are the poor in spirit. And Luke's telling blessed are the poor, period. We have buried the Sermon on the Plain in favor of the more beautiful and poetic Sermon on the Mount. So what do we do? We can't explain, we can't bury. After days of thinking about it, I think we say thank you. Jesus needed to say these words and we needed to have Jesus on record as having said these words more than we realize. I have no idea whether Jesus knew that Christianity would become the religion of empire. He was fully God, so maybe. But he was also fully human, so maybe not. That's above my pay grade, I can't answer that. But we all in this room, we know that Christianity became the religion of empire. And from where we now sit and what we now know, we must acknowledge that everything that, Je that Jesus warned his disciples to be wary of this day in this gospel many in the historic institutional church ran to with open arms. The church became rich, famously, exploitively so. The church became full, gluttonous to the point of embarrassing. I don't know whether one can say the church became a place of laughter. Maybe that's the one injunction they took to heart. So here we stand 
after centuries of Christian exploitation, greed, and abuse, and we never lost Jesus. No matter how often the church participated in a scheme that exploited the rich to aid the poor, we never lost Jesus. Jesus' words stood firm, quietly illuminating the deficiencies and lies that were swirling around in his name. Over the past couple of months, I've been reading Marie Arana's Silver Sword and Stone, a comprehensive telling of the conquest of Latin America. And while the violence and exploitation in Latin America did not begin with the arrival of the Christian conquistadors, Story after story reveals that the Christians escalated the violence, escalated the horrors once the continent and her people were under their total control. At one point as I'm reading this, I became enraged, close to tears, furious that these Christians tried to make Jesus complicit in their horrors. But then it dawned on me how badly they failed. Here I am, a child of that conquest. I don't exist and my people don't exist without this story. And yet I stand enamored by Jesus because Jesus still speaks hard words that I can't make go away, that you can't make go away, that the powerful can't make go away. Words that stick to my bones, illuminate the hypocrisies I participate in, and invites me to dream a bigger, more expansive dream. I'm smart. I know the history. You're smart. You know the history. I should be rejecting Jesus. And I think at some point you've probably been like, I should reject Jesus too. Yet here we are, affirming with our lives and in this time, that Jesus had something to say. And while I don't all understand, I don't understand all Jesus had to say, I really want to. And a large part of that has to do with Jesus uttering these few dark sentences on rather boring topography. <laughs> no, I don't like hearing Jesus dismiss riches, food, laughter, and flattery. Who does? These words rub me the wrong way and I don't like it. But they're exactly the kind of rub I need. They're the kind of rub everyone in the world would do well to contend with every once in a while. And so my friends, that's why I'm thankful this day and every day. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father.
Gracious and loving God, you see into the deepest needs of our hearts and invite us to follow you and to listen to your voice. Receive our prayers as we call upon you. Loving one, you visit us in friendship and invite your church to be generous and hospitable neighbors to all. Fill us with your grace that we may be a community of kindness and compassion. Guide our efforts as we continue to understand and dismantle the efforts of racism in the church. O oh God of light, eternal one, you search our hearts and know us. Lay your hand upon our nation and upon all in authority throughout the world, that they may be instruments of your compassion and peace, that we may be known as people in whom there is no deceit. We pray especially for peace in Ukraine. May we live in a world where no sword is drawn, but the sword of righteousness, and no strength known but the strength of love. O oh God of light. <laughs> Wonderful creator, you have woven our bodies in the depths of the earth. Look upon the needs of a suffering world and bless all humanity that your healthful spirit and presence may do marvelous works for the relief of the world. O oh God of light. <laughs> Good and holy God, you fashion our lives day by day in your spirit. Increase in us your vision, that we may see your hand at work in our community. O oh God of light, we pray for those who are ill or in need, especially for Bob Anderson, Mary Pat Jones, Michael Lucinian, Catherine McGraw, Margaret Brenneman, Jane North, Peggy Treadwell, Jason, Tammy McMinn, Douglas Oten, Barbara Wickham, Olivia, Margie Trinity, Taylor, Anisa Garbin, Florence Hedeshi, and those whom we name now, either silently or aloud. O oh God of light, accept our prayers of thanksgiving, especially for the life and witness of Absalom Jones, whose feast day is today. The births of Richard Wright Whitesides and Matthew James Strauss. For all those smitten in love, whether for two months or for 50 years, may our hearts overflow with your playful, cheek blushing, can't help but smile love. And those blessings we name now, either silently or aloud. O oh God of light. Welcome into your beloved community, those who have died. We pray especially for Eve Polycarp, Maynard Nelson, and those we name now, either silently or aloud. O oh God of light. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with no gifts but ourselves. Accept and receive our lives, that we may be manifestations of your presence. Let the light of your spirit shine within and among us, so we may share in the mystery of your purpose of blessing for all creation, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Most merciful God, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of Christ be always with you. Good morning, it's a great joy to welcome you to St. Columba's Church. A special joy to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us for the very first time today. And if you're here for the first time, thank you very much for joining us. We're glad to meet you, to welcome you, to worship with you. And St. Columba's is a church on a mission to live God's love, and we're eager to connect with you and support you in your life with Christ. A Couple of quick announcements. First, thank you to those of you who have made a special gift in support of our outreach fundraiser, which is funding both our commitment to end family homelessness in the district and our commitment to support a family, refugee family from Afghanistan. If you haven't yet done so, uh, I invite you uh, to join us in that effort. Uh, next Sunday, our forum uh, will be led by Dr. Laura Holmes, who's professor of New Testament at Wesley Theological Seminary, and a look at uh, the Gospels. So please join us for that. That takes place at the 10.15 hour. Also, I mentioned this in the forum, and a couple of people said, maybe let others know. A couple of people have asked, why is the font now in the narthex? The baptismal font, the narthex, that's a fancy churchy word for portico or porch. Um, the font is there as a symbol of our entrance into the Christian life. And it, it marks the entry way. It has not always been thus architecturally or liturgically that it would be there, but it is there now. And the water in the font has been blessed, it is sanctified. And I invite you, if the Spirit moves you, as you pass in or out or by, to dip your hand in, get some water, and make the sign of the cross. Those of you that come from a Roman Catholic or higher Anglican tradition will be familiar with this. Others of you will think that's a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, that's okay. I invite you to try it and see how the Spirit moves in you. And now let us walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us a gift and sacrifice unto God.
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our sovereign God. God of blessing, we thank you always for making us in your image to serve the peace of all creation. You shared your name with our mothers and fathers, Sarah and Abraham, who left their home and became a blessing to all nations, Moses and Miriam, who went through sea and wilderness to the place of revelation, Deborah and Samson, who gave hope and justice to a people ruled by fear, Ruth and Jonah, who went to foreign soil and found a God who loves the stranger. From our ancestors in faith came Jesus, the son of promise, to fulfill the law, embody your love, and draw all people to himself. He accepted death to break its fearful hold. He was raised to life to share it in abundance. He comes again to break the bread and pour the wine of hope. Therefore, with all people whose story you have shaped, with women and men of faith in every part of the world, we glory in your generous love and sing in praise of you. ask that your Holy Spirit will fall upon us and upon these gifts, that these fragile earthly things may be to us the body and blood of our Lord and brother Jesus Christ, who on the night that he was betrayed gathered with his faltering friends for a meal that tasted of hope. Calling them to his table, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it to remember me. As on that night, so here and now, Jesus offers all that he was, all that he is, and all that he will be. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is God. God. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Therefore, we come in memory and hope, responding to your call and the promise that echoes from the dawn of all time. May mind and heart be held by your self-giving love, as we stand before the cross, approach the empty tomb, and praise the one whose name is lifted high above all earthly power. Receive our broken offering through your never-ending grace, and bind us in communion with all who share your gifts through Almighty God, in whom from the beginning of time and through the great expanse of space, all things are drawn into the ceaseless love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, you are welcome at Christ's table.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously Alice and Courtney, in the name of God, and in the name of St. Columbus, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts that Jean McNellis and Rose Gombe may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, for we are all share one bread, one cup. May Christ's bright star enlighten your mind and heart as you strive for equality, for justice, and for kindness in the world, and the blessing of the one holy and living God be among you and upon you this day and evermore. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Yes. <laughs> 